to you, Dr. Joe. I'm so grateful and humbled and, you know, excited to see you. Thank you so much for carving out this time and welcome to the podcast. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Irena. I'm so happy to be with you. So, um, as you know, your fantastic, life-changing book is soon to be published in Norway. So, first of all, thank you for the amazing book, amazing work you're doing. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I, I think my greatest joy is contributing to change. Mm. And you do, certainly. I'm curious, um, what inspired you to, to write the book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself? Mm, you know, I think uh, this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. I think this is a time in history to know how. And when I wrote my first book, <clears throat> I gave a lot of the neuroscience and the biology of personal change. It was a heavy science. and. And I was really fascinated with this concept called neuroplasticity and epigenetics, these two concepts. Because that's really, in some sense, changing the mind and changing the body, right? And so when I wrote that book, and I was in a few documentaries, um, when we did like uh, panel discussions uh, for uh, different reasons, uh, people started asking really important questions, questions like, all right, all right, so if my thoughts have something to do with my future, how do you do it? Mm. And I think that's a really important question. Yeah. And if my personality creates my personal reality, and or, so then in order for me to change my personal reality, I gotta change my personality, mm. how I think, how I act, and how I feel. Why is that so hard? Mm. And so, that became my interest. And the third question was, what do you do? Mm. It was a common question that people ask. So I thought really it would be great to give people a practical tool right. to understand that in order for them to create a new personal reality, um, they would really have to understand that 95% mm. of their personality is hardwired. Yes, in it's the automatic. subconscious. It's subconscious. Yeah. Um, We've thought the same things. We've made the same choices. Mm. Uh, we ha keep uh, doing the same things. We keep recreating the same experiences. We keep feeling the same emotions. And you keep doing it over and over again. Your biology becomes conditioned, mm. becomes habituated, becomes hardwired. And so I realized that the first step to change is becoming conscious of your unconscious self. Right. So conscious of how you automatically think that you wouldn't go unconscious to it in your right. waking day and become aware of how you speak and how you act mm -hmm. and that's how you change a habit you got to keep staying conscious and not defaulting and going unconscious and if people are curious like looking at your own habits how do i actually act and and what do i do exactly. during my day exactly i think the big one though is how we feel right? right so so i thought it would be a great idea to write a book to teach people how to unlearn and relearn to break the habit of their old self and then reinvent a new, mm -hmm. new self. That was the reason that I wrote that book. And when I studied spontaneous remissions from disease, and I talk about that in my first book, mm -hmm. I started to realize Im immediately that um, the importance of all of that was really taking information and doing something with it. And I looked at people that had spontaneous remissions and they were doing that exact thing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this would, if it worked on them, why not try it on people and f tease out what those ideas are? So breaking the habit is about the how-to. We give people knowledge and information, and we combine quantum yes. physics with neuroscience and neuroendocrinology and psychoneuroimmunology and epigenetics, only in a way simply enough to understand mm. what you're doing and why you're doing why? it, right? And when you understand the what and the why, the how gets easy. Yeah. So the first half of the book is just combining all those sciences demystifying what meditation is, talk about what change is, uh, you know, remind people when they default and go unconscious why they do that. Right. And then the second half of the book is, okay, so how do you do it? Mm -hmm. So let's practice the steps and see if you can build this kind of uh, uh, process of change for yourself. Because if you start changing, in any one of those ways, your life should change. Right. And that should be the experiment. Yes. So the book is an opportunity for people to 
to apply, to personalize, to demonstrate, to initiate knowledge and information, to have a new experience. Mm. And that is the most important point, I think, that it's really a how-to book, like a step, a guided step, step-by-step step on how to change. So, yeah, so um, I mean, I think like learning anything, whether it's to dance the salsa or to hit a tennis ball or to knit or whatever it is, you got to learn steps, yes. right? And you get those yes. steps worked out. And then if you keep practicing those steps, the, the three steps become one step, yeah. becomes one move, right? And so we thought that if we could give people step-by-step -step, you know, processes, they, they could over time yeah. uh, make it more, more uh, familiar for them. So, of course, the first step would be to go outside and buy this book that is now <laughs> available very soon in uh, Norwegian bookshelves everywhere. So also, I have to ask you, I have a feeling that parts of this book has to come from like divine downloads. Could you tell <laughs> me about the writing process? Is, is that? Well, <clears throat> to be really honest, um, it's not my favorite thing in the world to write um, <laughs> yeah, because it really requires me but focusing you, on. Do you have written how many books? Like Four books. Four yeah, books. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm a pragmatist and I'm very interested in understanding kind of the science of change, right? And so, so I mean, for me personally, I, 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 wanna, I wanna ask really important questions, mm. really important questions, and I wanna look for those answers. And I think that's really, really important. So I'll ask the question just so that I'm inspired to look for the answer. Now, I also trust my intuition a lot because I've had really profound experiences in my own life in changing myself and seeing my life change and in practicing some of these principles. So um, I, I, through experience, have had y unique unknown moments that have caused me to see things differently. Mm -hmm. So I try to write both from that scientific perspective and at the same time infer my own personal experience right. from what I know. Because I, I all I can offer people is my greatest understanding of the truth and then numerous opportunities to experience mm. it, right? So I wanna balance that kind of knowledge and philosophy right. with the practical experience, mm. you know? And so I've had my own experiences that have changed my, my view of reality, changed change me in some way. So I, I do my best to, to balance both of those. And speaking of your first book, Evolve Your Brain, um, you there in detail actually exp uh, what has describe the tremendous accident that you were uh, part of. However, I have never heard you speak of it ever since. So I guess that there, that's not a coincidence. Could you just like <laughs> share how come that you so obviously don't s s talk about? I, I would I would suggest anyone curious that go and buy the book, evolve your brain, and they can f like because that obviously also was a starting point for much of this work. Yeah, I mean, I don't talk about it any longer because it's not who I am. Right. But, but what I do love to talk about are stories of transformation mm. that, that, that have nothing to do with me. I never want this work to be about me. I want it to be about you. Mm. Right? I want you to have your own experiment, right? So it's important then for you know, us to be, uh, in a sense, practical and, and aware right. of what we're doing. So my, my experience... Uh, I would have never be, be sitting here if I didn't have that experience. Mm. But it's not about me. There's so many great stories of people yes. that are healing themselves of all kinds of different health mm. conditions. And I have to say this with a certain amount of awareness because uh, Joe Dispenza, me, who I consider open-minded, uh, I have been s pleasantly surprised with some of the transformations and healings that have taken place for us from diseases that I never thought could heal. Uh, and so it's changed my belief mm -hmm. uh, on what's possible. And those stories are more important than me. Those yeah. are the four minute miles. Yeah. And when yeah. you look at that person telling the story and it's unbelievable mm -hmm. and they look no different than anybody else mm -hmm. and you, they're speaking truth, right? They're, there's nothing like a good story, the allegory. Mm -hmm. The person in the audience that's facing a health condition is seeing the example of truth right in front of them. And 
that gives them permission to believe mm. that it is a possibility yes. for them, right? Mm. And because that person, as the example of truth, is causing the person in the audience to become aware of a possibility that they weren't quite truly aware mm. of because there's evidence. Yeah right in front of them. So I think there's so many wonderful stories of transformation that I think supersede my own personal yeah. experience. And I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be there. there I want it to be mm. enough people that it's undeniably yeah. uh, possible. So it's not one, it's the collective, right? And so I'm, I'm one of them and I've met so many of your students and I can just like, you know, confirm what you're saying. It's about your students and the work that they, the results that they create for themselves. Mm. However, also, I, I, you said this on numerous occasions, like h people seem to be almost craving a, a, a traumatic experience in order to like get the motivation to change. Like they yeah. need the, the disease or they need the trauma or they need the crisis. Why is that? Why is it so <laughs> hard to change without having that kick in, yeah. the, in, kick in the butt? Well, I think there's a part of us that always knows better. That's right. our conscience, right? And then we stop having a conscience, that, that, that kind of checkpoint starts to diminish. Um, you know better, but you can't change it, right? Mm. And so when you change, you're going to be uncomfortable. Mm. So the person is aware that they have to change, but they don't trust the unknown. Mm. They, they, the, the they don't have the evidence yet. Well, of course, but the familiar feeling that they're living by every day is not going away. Mm. And so they have to be brought to their knees so that they're no longer interested in returning texts. They're no longer interested in going to dinners with the same people and talking about mm. the same mundane things. They don't care what you think of them. They don't care what they look like. They're not sure of the friends that they have or the relationships. This is a questioning moment. And when nothing makes that feeling go away, you're no longer yourself any mm. longer. And that's the moment you can see yourself through the eyes of someone else. And that point where you're, you're feeling so separate from how you normally live your life mm. is the moment you create this concept called metacognition. You can begin to objectify your subjective self. You can see mm. how you've been constantly thinking <laughs> and the memories that you live by and the beliefs that you have. You start noticing how you speak, how you act mm. around certain people in certain circumstances. You're noticing that you're spending the majority of your last two years of your life feeling really unworthy and insecure, right? right? And you start becoming conscious of those unconscious programs. And a lot of times the human condition is, uh, I know it's going to be uncomfortable. I'd rather suffer than take a chance and possibility, yeah. right? Then to the point where they finally have the diagnosis or the trauma mm. or the betrayal or whatever it is, you can't go back to business as usual. Yeah. You can't, you, you, know, you know you can't go back. You just can't, but you gotta go this in mm. another direction. And that's when you start asking bigger questions. Mm. Now I say you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change mm. in a state of joy or inspiration. Yeah. So if you're defined by a vision of the future every day and you understand how to actually apply some of these principles, and you marry a clear intention, which is a function of brain coherence, with an elevated emotion, which is a function of heart coherence. And you say, when I finish my inner work, I want to get up feeling like my future has already happened. I want to teach my body emotionally what it feels like to be healthy, to be wealthy, to be mm -hmm. free, to be in love, whatever that is. If you start doing that and marrying that thought and that feeling that image and that emotion, that stimulus and that response, you'll start elevating your state. Now, instead of viewing yourself from the lowest denominator where you can see yourself, I say, why not change your state of being every day and maintain it and from that elevated state, still be able to become conscious of the old self. Maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day as the experiment you should start seeing evidence in your life. There should be some reflection from the universe that matches who you're being. And, and so it's important for people to understand that they can elevate their state and become as conscious of their old personality self instead of hitting that lowest denominator. And I do think really that the hardest part about change is not making the same choice mm. as you did the day before. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, you're stepping from the known into the unknown 
and you can't predict it. Mm. And that's uncomfortable, mm. right? So people run back to the familiar and they say, this feels better. You know, that feels familiar to them. And so crossing that river of change, there is some kind of neurological, biological, chemical, hormonal, genetic death of the old self. Yeah. So I will share with you. Um, I wanted to show you my notebook. However, my luggage got lost somewhere <laughs> in Amsterdam, but that's fine. So I went to my f first uh, workshop with you in Poland earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I wrote my clear intention with the letter J, standing for Joe. <laughs> so my clear intention would to be publish your book in Norway. Invite you as a guest on this podcast. So it's like a pinch me moment, this entire conversation. You're waking up in your dream. Yeah, I am. And the last thing, of course, creating a success. That was the fourth. I know that it's already happening. However, the, the third uh, uh, thing on my list was welcome you, welcoming you on stage in Norway. Ah. Just so you know. Okay. Just putting it out there. Okay. Uh, that's wonderful. And the elevated emotions that you just described, I would be grateful. I would be proud. And also feeling humble. Because like you say, it's about serving, right? Just knowing now that this knowledge will be available to Norwegians who haven't had the chance to read your work yet in Norwegian. It's just like we are just parts of a, such a bigger puzzle. And so I can just like um, say that the, the techniques you're learning people, they work. And it was not coming from a place of trauma. It was from a state of joy and inspiration, like you said. Yeah. Would that even be possible? It is. We're sitting here. Yeah. I think that um, when you wake up in your dream yeah. like this and you realize, my God, I created this. And by the way, I, I've, I may have seen you, but I've never met you before. I, I mean, the series of events that led this to, to this moment were really um, quite unique. Yeah. So, so I love for a person to realize that they've created an event in their life because mm. they're more prone to get up and do the work yeah. tomorrow because they'll believe in themselves. And when you believe in yourself, you got to believe yeah. in possibility. And also when we have manifested one thing in our life, what's the next opportunity, right? So when I came to the second uh, workshop with you in, in Cancun earlier this year, I don't know what you did in there. If you had something sprayed in the room or... <laughs> <laughs> I had these magical, mystical, energetic uh, experiences. It was, and your sign, uh, the, um, uh, the scientist, Dr. Hamel, who is, uh, who's like doing a lot of, conducting a lot of research on, on your work. He compared the experiences that some of us had with like doing drugs. Yeah. So, the, so. What's happening? What's hap yeah. What happened to me? Well, um, <laughs> If you think about anything that you've never experienced before and you experience for the first time, that novelty, that is the unknown, right? And I think there's more to reality than meets the eye, mm. right? I think the probability that we see the truth of reality is zero. I mean, the atom's mm -hmm. 99.9999 nothing. It's energy, it's information, frequency. So we just happen to capture the particle, which is a very small percentage yeah. of reality. I think our brains have been shaped and molded that way. So you give people the information for an unknown experience. And so we started studying uh, what happens in the brain with functional MRIs. And it turns out that the part of the brain that's always trying to predict the next moment, you know, the default of always trying to lay a known down over an unknown that our, our, our students have the ability to shut that system off to such a degree mm -hmm. that they could move mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. into the present moment. And that's the unexpected. And it turns out when you don't expect anything to happen, the unexpected happens. That's what our brain scans show. So then when we look at the functional imagery of the brain, the person who's having that transcendental moment, their brain looks like they're on psilocybin. It's the same, same pattern as if they were taking some exogenous substance to cause them to have a profound experience, but their nervous system's making a pharmacy of chemicals mm. 
as doing the exact same thing endogenously within the body. Right. And so the side effect of that or the interaction of what happens in the brain when that occurs causes the brain to become less modulated, less compartmentalized. Mm. So the brain doesn't really, um, over time, the different networks don't really communicate or neighborhoods or communities don't mm. really communicate. The brain becomes very modulated or compartmentalized and the brain fires out of order because of that. That when the person's having that transcendental experience, the whole brain starts uh, becoming less modulated and less compartmentalized, more synchronized. Mm. So instead of having these individual clusters firing out of order like a lightning storm in the brain, the whole brain is in cadence. The whole brain is in um, high levels of order. Right. And there's a, a high amount of coherence that takes place in the person's brain. So the person that's having that unknown experience, it's very somatic, like oh, that was energy. Like I just didn't know that I could have that. And this is what our this is what our analysis shows, and it's very emotional. Mm. Like oh my God, I never knew that I could feel that amount of love, mm. or that amount of joy, mm. or that amount of connection, or that amount of grace, or bliss, or ecstasy. Mm. So when we look at the amount of energy that's in the brain in our quantitative analysis with our quantitative EEGs, there is an enormous amount of gamma brainwave patterns right. in that person's brain. Now, gamma is super consciousness, but it's not just a change in gamma a little bit. It's an enormous amount of gamma and a very high frequency and very coherent. And when that occurs, the person reports to experience this level of ecstasy, an arousal. And the arousal isn't fear, it's not pain, uh, it's not anger or aggression, which is typically how we switch on that sympathetic nervous system. The arousal is a connection with mm. energy, it's mm. frequency, and, and that's what happens, mm. right? And so you had an unknown experience that will change you forever, but it didn't come from your interaction with three-dimensional reality. Mm. Somehow it came uh, by the way you changed something yeah. within you, yeah. right? And you can't go back to business as usual when that occurs. It's a before and after. It happened on the Thursday, if you remember. Like you started on the Monday, so that would be day four. And I was thinking for the first three days, what am I doing wrong? I'm really trying here. I'm really trying hard. And then at some point, I just decided, like, whatever. I just let go. And yeah. that's when the yeah. mystical, magical wow. happened. There's a really, I feel like there's just a really delicate balance between intention and surrender. Right. And I think if you over-intend, you're trying. Yeah. Many people, are they over-surrender, they're lazy and lethargic, and they don't really right. do anything, right? So it's like a razor's edge. You've got to have this balance uh, because when you have that balance of intention at the same time surrendering and trusting, that's when you start having the unknown because you're, you're not controlling the outcome right. or forcing the yeah. outcome or predicting the outcome. And so, you know... <laughs> People, um, they come to our events and they really think they're doing their meditations wrong as they're going through that process of learning. Right. But they're actually doing it right because they're coming up against all the unconscious yes. thoughts, the emotions, the agitation, the frustration, the impatience. You cannot have a mystical experience feeling those feelings because those feelings are from known experiences mm. emotionally. <laughs> so you got to finally get to that point where you get beyond the control and the emotion and you finally surrender and trust and and then we have to lay down everything we've learned our whole entire life mm. to do something greater and that just takes a little bit of practice right. and finally when you start figuring it out you you start having these transcendental experiences so that's also what when i uh, when i mention um, my own experiences people say well would that be available to everyone i don't know what would you say um, would it be available to everyone? Yeah, I do. I do think it's just like learning how to do anything. You right. Just, you just really have to practice. And the experience, your subjective experience that you had will not be the same as the person mm. having their own experience. Good they, point. And we have a language analyst. Uh, we work with the uh, University of Central Oklahoma. We have an a, a, a language analyst who's kind of looking at these 
transcendental experiences. And he does not have the language to explain his own <laughs> transcendental right. experience that happened to him. Because all you can do is use metaphors. Right. You can only use analogies. It was like this thing, and, but it wasn't like that. It was like this. <laughs> and you're drawing from knowns yeah. in your brain to try to connect to that unknown experience, right? right? And you're preoccupied constantly. Well, what the heck happened to me? Yeah. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. You have to review it. And, and for me, sometimes it has taken me months Mm. to be able to find the language right. because the circuitry in my brain that is built by all my experiences in my three-dimensional sensory external reality, mm. I'm, this information is not coming from that identity. Mm. It's coming from the hope another part of the brain is experiencing right. something really amazing. That's the unknown, right? So the person has to use a lot of metaphors and a lot of associations to build a model and get enough circuits firing to get that new s connection in the brain, that and it's and it's uh, it's very it, it's inevitable. Like you just don't know the language right. yet. So, I want everybody to have those experiences because that experience enriches their brain. Mm -hmm. That's what experience yeah. does. And when they open their eyes and they come back to three dimensional reality, their spectrum of reality is broadened. Remember, we don't see things how they are; we see things how we are. Right. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the brain is wired to perceive that other 99.999% of reality that's dimensional, that the brain has edited out because it's not wired, mm -hmm. you know, for energy and frequency or uh, the, the unknown. It's wired for everything in three-dimensional reality. One of the metaphors you used, I remember, um, in uh, Cancun was, it's like making love to the universe. I think that's the most precise description I've heard that's so far. That's not the only one, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like that, that is like one of, I think that, that because it's like this undescribable yeah. force. Well, I, I will tell you this, because I've interviewed enough people when I've seen their brain in real time move into these elegant states, you know. Um, there is some kind of very profound moment for them um, where they say, I, I just didn't know mm -hmm. that I could feel that mm -hmm. much love mm -hmm. or I never knew there was that much energy mm -hmm. that I, f I felt an energy I'd never felt mm -hmm. before. I felt so whole. I felt so grateful to be alive. I was so humbled. I felt so awake, so f vitalized, so mm -hmm. full of energy. These are words to describe that subjective experience. And that's important because not that, that emotion is not what they typically feel, but mm. the payoff is not coming from the new wardrobe. It's not coming from the sports mm. car. It's not coming even from a relationship that they've had. And they could have a great, great relationship <laughs> and feel really great emotions. This is just a lot more. Yeah. A higher oh. intensity. So the, but, the, but the realization for everybody when I talk to them mm. is I realized it wasn't coming from out there. Mm. It was oh, within me. It's, oh, my God. And that's when they stopped looking for anything out there to make them feel a certain way. They start wanting to develop this kind of love affair with, uh, with their own process, right? right? And, and it's greater and greater degrees of love, right? I have to say, though, that it comes with side effects because the amount of energy, I wasn't really able to contain it for a while. So, and, and, and you are a trained chiropractor. Um, is that what it's called? In yeah, there? a few lifetimes ago. Right. Yeah, yeah. However, my chiropractor, when I got back, um, he told me that I had gotten a small whiplash. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I, I don't know how I try to tell people <laughs> this, and they don't believe me. Um, it's a moving freight train. Right. It's it? an enormous amount of energy, and if it's, and and I'll, I can speak for myself, or I can speak. Uh, about enough people who had that experience, you you need a moment to kind of relax into this. This isn't like this is it's a big moment, yeah. and you have to learn how to relax into this very very intense amount of energy. And you want it, and you don't want it. Yeah. And you got to learn how to relax, and it's super intense, and it's unknown. Mm -hmm. And then your heart starts racing, and then your brain starts going all and. This is just a process, right? right? So I tell people it's big. 
And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. And I, um, and I know the moment they have that moment, they stop me in the elevator all the time and say, I just had no idea mm. that it was that big. Yeah. And then I just smile at them because mm. I, I, want, I want them yeah. to have that experience. The whole reason we do this work, mm. I want them to have that experience. And if the body is processing, the autonomic nervous system is processing very high frequencies, um, anything that's out of order, structurally, mm. energetically, musculoskeletally, uh, uh, immunologically, uh, the, the energy has to find a path, you know, through the connective tissue, through the spine. Uh, you know, it's got to move in a lot of times. It's just, it's finding those areas where there's been mm. trauma, physically, trauma, emotionally, trauma, yeah. chemically, that's stored in the body, and it's got to shake it loose. And I don't, it's, it's going to move one way, and we know that all the time. If you kind of ride that wild steed, and you can kind of hang on, it's going to go right to your brain. And yeah. when it does, uh, I've seen, I've watched people on the ground have that moment. I just see a big smile on their face. <laughs> they just, uh, and, and, and a lot of times you see what's called ab reactions in the body. The body's, it's, it, the body has an innate consciousness, yeah. right? It has a rudimentary consciousness, an intelligence. And it wants to get the, uh, the suffering, the trauma, mm -hmm. the abuse, the guilt, the shame, the unworthiness. It wants to get it out. Yeah. And y you could control it consciously and stop it, but, but why would you want why to? Why would you want that? Because that's exactly <laughs> why we're doing it. And, 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 and if people understand that that's the side effect of a change in consciousness, that there's a change in energy. Mm. If they understand that and they're willing to let the story of their abuse as a child that's been stored in their body emotionally, it want, the body's finally got the permission to let mm. it go and it's gonna, it's gonna shake it loose, right? And the person understands that and they understand that this, it's almost happening to them. The body is moving kind of automatically, right? Mm. The more you relax into it, we found out the more you relax into it, the more it trans, transmutes into something else. Right. So, but but it's, a, it's an alarming moment. So this is where the instantaneous, uh, instantaneous uh, what do you call it, remissions? Like where people ah, actually, yeah. uh, because there are also so many inspiring stories of healing taking yeah. place in your yeah. communities. Yeah, there seems to be an immediate biological upgrade, upgrade in the body. Mm -hmm. And it's like energy is informing matter when they connect to this invisible field, right? And so um, stress, disease, is autonomic dysregulation. Yeah. And the autonomic nervous system is that automatic system that's controlling every other system in your body your digestive system, your immune system, your reproductive system, your cardiovascular system, it's, the, it's giving you life. And so when stress um, happens and we move out of homeostasis mm. and we move out of balance, you do that enough times, the autonomic nervous system can never recalibrate back to order and that's called dysregulation. Yeah. And the brain is very incoherent and the messages from the nervous system that's touching every cell in the body is not carrying coherent information. It's very incoherent. So the cells start dysregulating as well and they can't communicate with each other and that's dis-ease or some system in the body breaks down. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the autonomic nervous system uh, in these brain scans when the person's having that moment, there is an enormous amount of autonomic regulation and the, the, they're in such high frequencies mm. of gamma that the cell now <laughs> is getting a whole lot of information, coherent information, and the faster the frequency, mm. the higher the energy. Mm. So the cell is being jiggled with information and it causes the body to be lifted. And all disease is a kind of a lowering of frequency in the body. And the body is lifted with light, it's lifted with energy, and the person connects and when that happens, they have this sense of knowingness. They'll, uh, you know, we've seen stage four cancers completely in remission. We've seen eczema. We've seen myasthenia gravis. We've seen uh, people that had brain injuries that were in wheelchairs, mm. that had spinal cord injuries. I know this sounds crazy. Blind people seeing mm. somehow they took a bite of wholeness. 
and the body becomes restored in some way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the stories are un, uh, unbelievable mm -hmm. because, uh, again, they have a very somatic experience, like I felt this energy, very emotional feelings. I felt an enormous amount of love. And that experience is literally dragging the brain and body out of the past yeah. into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And the ecstasy, the bliss, the connection, whatever it is, mm -hmm. is raising the body into greater levels of frequency, closer to source, closer to pure mm -hmm. love. When we take the blood of the people that have those kind of experiences, mm -hmm. there's information in that blood that somehow causes an immunity to very powerful viruses, contemporary viruses. Somehow the cell cannot let the virus in. It just mm -hmm. has an intelligence that's greater than its environment. And we've exposed the, the, the cells to the blood of advanced meditators and that virus could not enter the cell. There's information in that blood. You know, you have mitochondria in your cells, you know, about 200 per cell. And those are the energy packets of mm -hmm. the cell. And cancer loves to multiply and move. And mm -hmm. so when you take the plasma of a person who has this moment and you put it in the presence of all kinds of different cancer cells, it takes the energy, the mitochondrial function in the cancer cell is diminished by 70%. Wow. There's information that in the blood somehow that's anti-carcinogenic, right? Somehow there's a change in the person's microbiome immediately. They're a different person, different microbiome. All the microbiomes that are really healthy tend to flourish. The brain tends mm -hmm. to be more organized afterwards. The heart, the, the volume of love, the mm -hmm. amount of the amplitude of coherence that person is feeling is not a little love. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of love, <laughs> right? Um, somehow the nervous system uh, manufactures opioids, endogenous mm -hmm. opioids that reduce pain and create more relaxation and euphoria. And we see this not in like 10%, not in 20%, mm -hmm. but in like the majority of people who do the work. And so many times when we're looking at a scan, 10 scans or 12 scans in real time, we're looking at sometimes half of those people, if not more, are having these elegant moments where they're their brain is going into these elevated states. Mm -hmm. So then if you look at half the people that we're measuring, the 10 people, and you look out into the audience, you got to wonder if you extrapolate that number, at least mm -hmm. possibly half the people in the room are having some mm -hmm. really profound experience. Right. And so take all of your attention off of everything physical, mm -hmm. everything known, everything material. Mm -hmm. Stop narrowing your focus on your problems, on your pain, on the people, objects, and things start opening your awareness to energy and frequency. Pay more attention to that and less attention to you. Give people the understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it. If they keep going after it and they finally stop saying there's something wrong with me because that's the only thought you mm. got to get beyond. Stop trying to control the outcome. Mm. Surrender. Learn how to change your brain waves. Learn mm. the science, the information. Trust the process and linger as pure consciousness, and you're going to run into something really big. Mm -hmm. I, I can put my name on the letter as well. And I'm just curious, because when you now, I've seen this, and I met a lot of your students who had had these experiences. To me, that sounds like a huge threat against the medical establishment. Um, and I have enough. I, completely respect the medical model. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of things that medicine has done to create more longevity and more quality of life. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Um, but what happens when the chemo is not working, mm -hmm. that the surgery didn't work, mm -hmm. that the radiation treatments didn't change anything? What happens when the vegan diet didn't work, the gluten-free <laughs> diet didn't work, the intermittent fasting didn't work, mm. the vitamins, the herbs didn't work? What happened when the chanting didn't work? Yeah. You know, it's nothing changes in our life until we change. Yeah. And when that person starts to change and their biology starts to change, and we have evidence that that's true, they're not doing their meditations to heal. Mm. They're doing their meditations to change, and they understand when I change, mm. I should heal. Now, 
the conversations that I'm having with physicians and research scientists were not the conversations I was having 10 years right. ago. I mean, this was all pseudoscience. I can say on a more probable basis than not, this is not pseudoscience. Mm. We have so much evidence mm. now, it's undeniable. Mm. So when their patient comes back that had bilateral metastatic breast cancer mm. uh, that was facing a double mastectomy, and then all of a sudden they get their scan and there's no evidence mm. in their breast, in their bone, uh, bones, in their uh, lymph nodes, there's a, the doctor, starts to wonder, what did you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's not normal, right? So we have this amazing evidence in our scientific research. We show that evidence to doctors who, who at least are curious about, yep. and it's undeniable. And it's not, it's not like one out of four. We're talking about somewhere between 75% mm -hmm. and 100% of the people Mm -hmm. that come to a week-long event with a measurement. It's, a, it's working re really well, in fact, better than any drugs. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has a mind to see that is going to be going like, well, how long was this event? Was it three years, seven <laughs> days? You're seeing these type of changes? It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable to the scientists because mm -hmm. they keep running the experiment expecting a different outcome. Mm -hmm. But they're getting the same outcome. They're changing their belief right in that moment. Mm -hmm. and this is empirical science. So we have great evidence in our scientific research, mm. but we started doing that scientific research because of the testimonies of people having these yeah. powerful transformations uh, in their health. So the doctors that are open-minded, and we have a huge consortium of physicians now in our work and healthcare providers and researchers, they saw the data. They, they actually had their own healings mm. when nothing else worked. Mm. I mean, cancer researchers mm. have had their own healings. Physicians, many of them had their mm. own healings. Something awakens yeah. in them. They start remembering why they wanted to serve in the first place, what, mm. was interest, what they were interested in. Mm. And, and somehow now they, they, they are more kind and, and they're offering information to their patients now. Uh, so we have that community of people that are understanding things from a different perspective. We have a lot of scientists now looking at the data saying, what is going on? What, what, is, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Let's measure this, let's measure mm -hmm. that. And we just haven't been disappointed up until this point. Now, I'm at the point in my life where I really don't care like mm -hmm. uh, whether you believe it or not or you want to challenge me. And I have seen the evidence. I'm not going to dispute that. Um, I'm more interested in the person yeah. who really wants to see if it's the truth for them. And I love when you say, like, science is the modern word for mysticism. Yeah. I think, you know, science is that contemporary language. And, yeah. and I've, I've been in front of audiences for long enough now uh, to know that the moment you use words that are based in tradition or religion mm. or spiritual practices, you're going you're gonna to divide an audience because yeah. everybody's going to have their own thought about what that is and they mm. don't really know. But rename it yep. in some way. Give them the endocrinology, the biology, the mm. cellular epigenetic understanding, electromagnetism. Give them the understanding of neuroscience and mm. quantum and combine it all together in a model. And it's, uh, it, it's important for people to remember the information. So have them teach it back and review it yeah. and get it wired in the brain. So important to do that because that's really the neurological building process mm. of firing and wiring because yeah. it's it's so much easier to forget this information than mm. to remember it, right? So combining all those sciences and nothing's left to conjecture, nothing's left to superstition, mm. nothing's left to dogma. You understand exactly what you're doing and why you're doing yeah. it. When that occurs, the how gets easier, and you switch on the prefrontal cortex, and it's the boss of the brain, and it silences the rest of the brain. Right and says, this is my intention. Mm. And the moment that happens, you actually produce a greater outcome. Mm. So now I'm just thinking about uh, a 54-year-old woman called Kari uh, sitting somewhere in Norway listening to this and thinking, where the hell should I start? Yeah, <laughs> Except well, I buying think, the book, of course. <laughs> well, look, I think we innately know how to change. 
I think everybody's changed at least once in their life. I think they've gotten to a point in their life where they said, I want to become this or I want to do this and I want, and they make up their mind, right? Mm. And uh, making up your mind to change is an event when you really truly are mm. honest with yourself and you make up your mind. So a great place to start though, if you truly want to change and just say, okay, mm. um, if I change myself, will my life change? I think breaking the habit is really a good place mm. for people to start. Why? It's the practical, it's the practical application of those sciences mm. so that you can prove to yourself that if I change the way I think, change the way I act and change the way I feel and start wiring my brain to think differently, start to rehearse how I'm going to act in my life and install that circuitry. Let me teach my body emotionally how I'm going to feel. Mm -hmm. what, do I, what do I have to let go of in order to be that new person? Mm -hmm. um, so the practical application that breaking the habit is a good place to start for people. I mean, there's the, the formula, which is available for people. There's progressive workshops. Um, that are just a lot more content. But to start, breaking the habit is really a simple way for people yeah. you know, to get, you know, to, get to, to remember how to do it, because we've all done it at least once. Right. So I also believe in small steps, small incremental steps. So like, okay, I can handle this, okay, I can do this, and then build from there. Because what we have been talking about is not something you will get on your first day. You can't read this book and like... No, oh, this is just you doing the work. You're doing the work. You're doing the work and you're, 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 you're getting out of the bleachers yep. and you're getting on the playing yep. field. And so it, it, is, it is lighting a match at times in a dark place. You can't tell the story of your past any longer. You've got to start telling the story of your future. You can't keep romancing your past. You've got to start mm. romancing a future. You've got to change for mm. your life to change. Right. So the person who says, okay, I'm a practical person. Um, nothing's working. My life isn't moving. So let me see if I change, if I start seeing those synchronicities, mm. those coincidences, those serendipities. So step by step, again, I, there's you know, four weeks that we do the meditation and you start with just finding that present moment. It's so important mm -hmm. to know when you're there and when you're not. The present moment is the unknown. Mm -hmm. And you gotta learn how to be present. So you practice that. And then you add the unlearning process. Then you add another process. So it's, you know, every week you add something else. And so you the first week there's one step and the second week you the first and the second step. So at the point you're at the fourth week, then it's, it's, it's more natural. It's no, it's a little bit, of a long meditation for most people, but if you're truly into it, yep. this is not the app where you do it for five <laughs> minutes and you expect your life to change. This is you really yeah. getting in that river of change mm -hmm. and understanding that, the, the, that that biological death of the old self is part of the process. That's the overcoming process, but then the second step is the becoming process. Right. So first we believe, then we behave, and then we actually become. Yes, that's the model that I love to use I in, love it. in the workshops. You know, I mean, it's taking philosophical, theoretical information yeah. and going from philosopher to initiate to master, yeah. right? From, from knowledge to experience to wisdom, from mind to body to soul, from mm -hmm. thinking to doing to being, to learning it with your head, applying it with your hands, knowing it by heart, mm -hmm. to believe mm -hmm. in a new possibility, mm -hmm. to behave as that person mm. to ultimately become that person. And the work is about becoming. Yeah. And also, like practically, that includes me sitting down, putting my butt down every morning, putting on my headphones, listening to Dr. Joe, listening to you tell me like you did this morning, let laughter be your prayer. What an, like as a writer, what a glorious sentence, let laughter be your prayer. I think the divine his. Uh, I think the divine has an amazing sense of humor, and I think that when people yawn, other people yawn. And when other people are happy and laughing, other people are happy and laughing. And our research also shows that people change people. Mm. And mm. if you're the example mm. of how you would love to see the world, you know, you'd mm. have to become that. Yeah. I think you give people, you know, permission to do the same. And a lot of times a smile mm. or a great <laughs> mood somehow changes somebody's life. You never and know. And it's actually, what do you call it, um, c uh, contagious. Yes. And we see that in our week-long retreats, you know, just like an infection can spread amongst the community and create <laughs> disease, 
in seven days you see health and wellness become yeah. as infectious as disease and that once that person pops through a certain level of consciousness or unconsciousness and they come on the stage and they're the example and they tell a story it's not uncommon that by the end of the event there are numerous people that are having those same experiences yeah. speaking of um, what's happening at these events i noticed like on the first day people were grumpy some have been sitting in line for an hour waiting for the room but the end of the event people <laughs> were so happy like can i give you a hug with total strangers there must be happening something with the oxytocin levels well obviously. yeah well that's one element that's one element and look uh, people who are <laughs> angry with themselves or angry with others. People mm. who hate themselves, they'll hate others. Mm. People who abuse themselves will abuse others. People who judge themselves will judge others. That's just how it is. Get a person to sit mm. for a long enough period of time with themselves mm. and, not, and not get up and turn on the TV or mm. pick up their cell mm. phone or scroll th through social media. Let them sit in the fire a little bit. What's mm. on the other side of the thought I can't? It's too hard. I'll never mm -hmm. change. It's my mother's fault. It's my culture's fault. It's politics. Sit on the other side of wanting to blame and complain and make excuses and not, not fall prey to those programs. Sit with that agitation, that impatience, that frustration and keep settling mm -hmm. the body back down to the present moment. Sooner or later, the animal will be conditioned or trained to a new mind. And when that occurs, there's a liberation of energy. Mm -hmm. And that liberation of energy causes energy to move right into the heart. We've measured this over and over again. And when it makes it to the heart, the heart is the center of wholeness, of oneness. It's the, it's the opposite. It's merging. It's, the, mm. it's polarity coming together. That feeling then causes the person to literally relax into their heart. Mm. And when energy is in the heart, it moves right to the brain. It tends to cause them to awaken in their brain. So then when that occurs, you feel so amazing, you don't want the moment to end. And so you're grateful. The person next to you is grateful. Their <laughs> heart is open. They feel so much joy, so much love. Of course, pro-social networks switch on in the brain, and we come together. We mm. commune. Mm. We connect. We trust. We, we're, the tribe is unifying. It's, that's, that's the mm. side effect. Mm. And we tend to appreciate life a whole lot more. Now, mm. I call that the natural state of being. Now, here's the crazy part. If you look at the genetic expression of what happens in seven days to a community of people, the flock, yep. the herd, mm. the tribe, for all different genomes, 2,000, 2,500 different genotypes, every individual with their own genes, at the end of seven days, 77% of the tribe is biologically evolving together. <laughs> They're expressing the same genes and making the mm. same proteins. There is a, the, the flock is biologically, and there's a change in consciousness. The emergent consciousness is changing a collective biology. The mm. probability of that happening is insane. Mm. And yet people are changing people. And the more grateful you are, mm. and the more in love with life you are, the more you feel connected emotionally to your future, mm. the more you trust. The, the more you stop control, and you've overcome that. And so people, I think, are wired to be goodness. They're, there's mm. goodness in people. And when, when they're not living in those survival emotions, the stress hormones where you're so selfish, you're controlling, you're competing, you're fighting, you're working, you're pushing, you're mm. trying, you're suffering, you're guilty, you're unworthy, you're unhappy, you're, you're victimized, you know. I think, I think when you trade those and you overcome those, mm. there's, there's, an, there's a, a blossoming that takes place in the individual. Mm. And when energy makes it to the heart, it's not only oxytocin. There's a field around the body. There's energy to the brain. The brain gets super creative. Mm -hmm. They start resolving problems in our life. It's no longer about us. It's about how we can contribute. Mm -hmm. And so you start being more kind and more caring and more loving and more present. And that's who we are mm -hmm. when we're not living in, in stress. So I'm going to end on this because you also taught me, taught me something that I never actually considered before. You have told me that this present moment is infinite that I can choose to be here now forever. So Dr. Joe, um, 
if you could feel the goosebumps <laughs> on me right now, uh, it's just a fraction of the gratitude I feel towards your work. So thank you so much again. Ah, no, it's a privilege to, to be with you, Irena. Thank you. You're welcome.